Hello, good morning, good afternoon. Namaste. Welcome to the Oracle Apex Office Hours JPAC April edition. Six Secrets of Apex. My name is Chaitanya. I'm a product management director at Oracle as part of the Oracle Apex product development team and I lead the Apex product management team at JPAC. Today, we have Ed Jones, who is a consulting member of technical staff at Oracle Apex team. And uh, he'll be presenting to us six secrets of Apex. Basically, you'll be amazed to learn the tips and tricks that Ed used to solve and address questions in various Apex internal and external forums. If you are new to Apex, you can get started by navigating to apex.oracle.com and learn how to build enterprise applications 20 times faster with 100 times less code. So please do visit apex.oracle.com. What do you get on apex.oracle.com? You have a whole lot of resources. This is the official website and one-stop shop for everything and anything about Oracle Apex. You do get information about the platform, what Apex is, what, why Oracle Apex is, and what low-code application development is with Oracle Apex. You will also be able to understand different use cases, solutions, applications, plugins, and success stories of Apex customers. There is lots of learning material, tutorials, education, documentation, videos, and lots of resources for you to learn Apex. And also, you have links to the community resources. And first of all, I would really like to thank on behalf of the entire Oracle Apex team, the Apex partners, customers, and the entire Apex community for helping us uh, and supporting us this new initiative of Apex Office Hours at JPAC. Next, I would like to talk about Apex Foundation's learning path. We have built the Apex product development team has developed this particular learning path, which is a three and a half plus hour expert training straightforward from the Apex product team. This is a virtual training. So enroll for free and learn for free today on Oracle University. And the URL is available over there, apex.oracle.com slash go slash foundations. We also will be having this available on LinkedIn Learning and Coursera third-party platforms. And coming up soon, you will be also uh, able to take the Apex Developer Professional Learning Path in the coming weeks. And also we'll be coming up with an updated certification which was validated and vetted on the latest and greatest of Apex. Now moving on, to know a little bit about today's speaker, Ed Jones is a consulting member of technical staff in the Apex product development team at Oracle. Ed has worked with many diverse platforms and technologies over the years. Ed enjoys giving back to various development communities by answering users' questions, offering solutions to their issues, and sharing the knowledge that he has gained. When Ed is not helping his lovely wife, three children, three cats, he likes to work on personal stuff like personal coding projects, surfing, mountain biking, and also playing guitar, but not all at the time, same time. So without further ado, let's pass it on to Ed Jones for Six Secrets of Apex. Over to you, Ed. Thank you, uh, Chaitanya, for that lovely introduction, taken straight from my uh, LinkedIn profile, I think, which is good. It's fine. It's still accurate. Uh, let me just uh, share my screen. Hopefully, you can see uh, the uh, Chrome window that I'm uh, sharing now. Um, yeah. So I, I am uh, tempting the uh, demo gods a little bit by presenting uh, out of an Apex application. I'm not a, a PowerPoint developer. I'm an Apex developer. So I'm using a, a, an Apex application to show all this. Uh, I am indeed Ed Jones. Um, and my official title, as Chaitanya has said, is consulting member of technical staff. But I prefer to call myself a code monkey. Um, I, I like writing code, which might seem weird for someone who works uh, for a low code development platform, um, but that's my um, that's what I like to do. Um, I live on the Sunshine Coast in Australia, so I do indeed like to go surfing whenever I can. Um, I've been on the Apex team uh, since 2020. Uh, I've been an Apex developer, like a user of Apex, um, since 2014. 
Um, I've been with Oracle itself since 2000, um, and I've been a user of Oracle technologies, although not Oracle, um, since 1994. And I got my first computer and wrote my very first line of code in uh, Christmas Day on 1983, when my parents bought me a little 8-bit computer, and I've been writing code ever since. Um, you can't find me on Twitter anymore, but you can find me on Mastodon if you want to see uh, me reposting uh, articles about old computers and pictures of cats, um, or if you want uh, more uh, professional uh, facade, then you can find me on LinkedIn. And I know that uh, thank you to all of you who have sent me uh, connection requests on, on LinkedIn. Um, I guess you found me via the, 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 the other Apex socials. Um, so what I spend most of my time doing uh, on the Apex team is um, developer or dev team experience. And this is not the improving the experience of you as Apex customers directly. It's improving the efficiency and the effectiveness of the, of the Apex team themselves, which has a side effect of um, making them uh, more productive, more effective, getting a better product into your hands so that you can yourself be, be more productive. Uh, sometimes I even do real work, uh, fixing bugs and things like that. But I also, as Chaitanya mentioned, answer lots of questions. Um, so you've probably seen the external forums um, for, for Apex questions. Uh, we also have a very similar product. In fact, it's exactly the same product, just a slightly different branch that we use internally for people to um, ask questions. And, and I enjoy uh, answering those questions. And that's really where this session came from. Um, I thought I'd share some of the answers to some of the questions that, that I've um, given people in the forums. Chaitanya's already shared most of these links. I guess if you're an Apex person, you will know these links already. It's apex.oracle.com to get started. There's more information on, on the Apex homepage links and customer success stories, all that all that sort of thing. Um, there's also the ideas app if you have a, a particular uh, feature that you would like to see in Apex that doesn't already exist or an improvement to an existing feature, you can go to the ideas app. Of course, the ideas app is an Apex app. Um, and this is the forums app that I was talking about before. Uh, this is public forums. Um, this is just the Apex section of it where I spend a good portion of my time. Um, but it all they also it also includes uh, forums for whole like dozens and dozens, hundreds of, of, of other Apex products. So uh, this is a place to hang up, hang out as part of the Apex uh, developer community. Uh, so that being said, like I say, I spend a lot of my time in those uh, forums answering questions. And so I collected together some interesting uh, answers from there. Um, and I thought I'd share them with you today. Now, you can all access this application. Um, I can't share it with you, unfortunately, before anybody asks that in, in the Q&A, um, because uh, it's not an officially supported application, um, and it contains some uh, resources that we're, we're not allowed to share. But you can, by all means, go in and, and, and take a look at it. Um, like I say, I hope you don't all jump on it now and it crashes. That would not be a, a good advertisement for Apex, but uh, it should be fine. Um, so what I'm going to go through in, in this application, some of these techniques are not necessarily documented, and therefore they're not necessarily supported. You know, we would like to support every single customer use case in Apex straight out of the box so that uh, people can do everything they want to do in a declarative way. But, you know, sometimes that's just not possible. So the techniques that I'm sharing are techniques that have, they're not completely unsupported. They have been given usually by members of the Apex team in answer to forum posts, always with the caveat that, you know, if it's not documented, it's not officially supported. But sometimes you've got to kind of break out of those, those guardrails to do to, to meet your particular use case and and, and do some uh, create find some more creative solutions. So if you're new to Apex, some of this is going to be quite code heavy and and it might be quite confusing. But hopefully, it gives you some ideas of some of the techniques that you can use in Apex applications that are maybe a little bit more advanced than what you find in some of the getting started tutorials. Um, and even if you kind of don't get what I'm talking about with some, with some of the more in depth code examples, um, hopefully you can see the techniques that are being demonstrated and you can then apply them to your applications. As I say, I, I can't share this application as it is with you, but you can look at the application. There's code samples in there and you can always ask questions on the forums or you can get in contact with me somehow and, and ask me directly. That's fine. Um, and as I say, some of these techniques, you know, we Chaitanya's slide about Apex development using a hundred times less code than, than traditional application development. That that is true. It's been verified by you know ex, ex, external uh, consultant firms that have that have measured these things. 
when you look at these examples, some of them might not look low code, but I can assure you they are lower code than they would be if you had to write it all yourself. So with that being said, be aware that some of this is going to be quite code heavy. Just let it flow over you. Uh, some of it is not necessarily documented or supported. So just beware of the techniques that you're using. OK, let's get into it. So you will find that a lot of, uh, as you'll see if you find me on Mastodon, a lot of my um, I, I like cats. I have three cats of my own. And so I think all of my examples here uh, seem somehow related to cats. Um, so the first one is this is using dynamic actions in Apex bound to elements in, in your Apex UI to update state in the server and also uh, then reflect those changes back into your UI. You know, traditionally, Apex has been like a, a, a a submit like you'll load a whole page you'll fill in some data you'll submit that whole page to the server it'll say some stuff to the server and then you'll get a whole new page with with the new information in it obviously that's how the internet worked back when apex was invented it's 20 odd years ago now and, and apex is, is cha obviously changed over those past 20 years and it's become kind of more more dynamic so you don't want to do a full page refresh every time you like something so the example of this is i've got these these little cat videos um and then when i click on these like buttons or the dislike buttons i mean why you would dislike a video of a kitten i don't know but maybe you would then you can change those and this is updating the record in the database to say how many likes there are for each video. And then it's sending back information to your UI so that you can update the, the user interface in your application to, to give you a live count. And by the way, if, if this is if there's multiple people updating this all at the same time, when you click the, the like button, you would see the new count of likes because it's again querying the, the whole database. So how this work? So this is a cards region with with a bunch of videos. It's basically like a report in 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 this kind of format with images and things. These are buttons in the UI that I can click, um, and then it goes away, talks to the server, sends back information. How does that work? All right, cool. I'm glad you asked. Uh, so for if you go and look at this application, every page has got like an about region that you can expand at the bottom. So the first thing you want to do is, uh, as I say, this is a report. It's a cards. Uh, or a report style region. It's it's a cards region, uh, which is driven by a, an SQL query. So you're somewhere in that query, you want to select like the total number of likes for each video, total number of dislikes for each video. And then what we're doing here is uh, selecting like a little bit of code to change the icon. So you can see on these where I personally have liked it. Um, it's kind of the filled in thumbs up where I haven't, it's, it's the number, but it's not filled in. Um, so in this case, it's looking to see whether I personally like that video or whether I dislike it. And it's changing this, or it's appending this little O dash thing to the, to the class of that particular button. The O is whether the, the font apex icon is open, like it's just the outline or whether it's filled in. So it's solid. Um, and then for each card region in there there's 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 things set up in that card region to display like a thumbnail of the video in the background and other things like that but also we add in these two buttons now you can go to the to apex.oracle.com slash ut which is uh, there's the link is there um which is the universal theme uh sample app and that'll tell you or give you a, a little utility to generate html to which looks like apex buttons and so you plug that into your uh cards region and then when this appears on the screen it'll look just like an apex button uh we add some attributes to it to talk about the video that where the the button is associated with and whether i'm liking it or whether i'm unliking it and then you know it's got stuff like this is where the icon changes this is the actual number of likes or dislikes for each video um so that's the html that's the markup just a note that in a future version of Apex, I can't tell you exactly which one, um, this will be made simpler. There'll be there's some templating uh, improvements that we've got in there that will make this a little bit simpler. It'll be the same kind of technique, but it'll be a little bit simpler. So then what we do is we create a dynamic action. This is Apex's way of kind of talking to uh, JavaScript on, on your client. So you create a dynamic action and you bind it to all these buttons. So we're going to target every button which has this class in it so every time someone clicks something with that class apex is going to run this dynamic 
action. It can do a whole bunch of things, but in this case, we're going to execute some JavaScript. We use this JavaScript API to call some server-side code, and then we pass in these attributes from the element that was clicked, which in our case is, is a button, right? So uh, we're going to run this bit of server-side code, and we're going to pass in these parameters. And then that's going to run. It's going to do some stuff. It's going to update the database, and it's going to send us back some data, which is then surprisingly enough, going to appear in this then callback. It's not technically a callback. It's a promise resolution, but it's effectively the same thing. Because this server-side processing happens asynchronously, you click the button, and then other stuff carries on happening in your user interface while the server-side code is being executed. That's just how um, JavaScript works for Ajax actions. Um, and then when that data comes back, it's going to give us information like the new count and whether we personally like it or not so that we can update our UI. This technique is used, like I say, a lot to make your Apex applications more um, interactive so you don't have to do a full page refresh to get to get new data back from the server um ag again there's 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 uh improvements to this uh coming in future versions of apex which will make this kind of binding server-side data to, to client-side data more more declarative but for now rest assured you can do it in this way um the ajax callback or oh, sorry this process that gets called this like video just looks like this i'm not going to go through every line of code. It's just looking at the current likes. It's deleting a like if you like something and then press like again, it kind of unlikes it rather than disliking it. Um, otherwise, it updates it to the new version. I mean, obviously, you're going to change this to, to do whatever server side updates you want. But in our case, it's it's just likes. Um, and then this is this is the bit where it sends back the data, right? Um, if the server side code is being called by Ajax. So it has to send back a JSON payload. And this is all that that is doing. It's telling you which video it's related to, how many likes there are in totals, how many dislikes there are, and whether I like it or dislike it. So we can update the UI. Now, you'll see from this uh, homepage, that, or the title of the session is Six Secrets of Apex. But Ed, there's only five things on here. Well, this is the bonus secret. So you'll see if I click on these little videos, a video player comes up, and we can play the little kitten in our browser in Apex. Now, Apex is very much not a video streaming platform, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you do this. But the use case that this particular uh, solution was was created for was for little training videos that people wanted to like um, deploy with their Apex application. Um, they wanted to be able to play um, videos in their Apex application that were kind of bundled with it. Um, the kind of issue is, especially on mobile devices, that mobile devices don't want to start playing video until they've downloaded like the whole lot of it, which is a problem when you know this uh, one here, this cat with the blanket is what, 288 megabytes long. So if you had to download all of that before you could start playing it, it, it wouldn't be very um, a very good user experience. And it would be tying up connections to your database while it downloads that whole file for somebody. So instead, you need to create a kind of custom ORDS REST handler, which understands things called range requests, which is where the browser requests like a little bit of the video. So it just wants the start of it, like a little short snippet that it can load super quick and start playing it while it starts downloading other chunks. Out of the box, things like Oracle Object Store support range requests. So if you can, store your videos in somewhere like that, or even better, store them in a, a dedicated video streaming platform. But if you must serve them out of your Apex application, then you can. And again, I'm not going to go through all the code of this, um, but basically it takes like the whole chunk of the video out of your database, chops it up into like a little chunk based on what the browser has requested and just sends that back to your user's browser. There is a, a bonus secret to the bonus secret, which is another technique, which again, you can find your way into this application, find your way to this link in the forums, um, and you can kind of repurpose, you know, the way that you can display images in an Apex UI, just by looking at a blob column in a table, you can kind of repurpose that to play videos instead of images. Again, I really recommend that you don't do it, but if you've just got like real short, snappy little training videos you want to play, you can do it, and it's quite a nice declarative way to do it with just like a little bit of code. Um, so that's cool. So like I say, this is showing you how to play videos in Apex if you must, and how to make your uh, user interface more dynamic. And you can use this kind of dynamic action and uh, kind of DOM update uh, technique in a whole bunch of different places. All right, next up, code snippets. So this is not necessarily code snippets. This is about, so I'm looking at, if you can see this, um, 
demo highlighted. So this is not really about the code snippets. That's just a, a, a way for me to demonstrate the, the, the technique. Um, so sometimes you're going to want to embed or display certain content in your Apex application, which is styled in a particular way. And maybe Apex's styles kind of collide with the styles that you want in your content, or maybe your content kind of tries to override some of the styles that Apex uses. Um, so what this technique is doing is kind of sandboxing that particularly style content into an iframe so that it is isolated from Apex and Apex is isolated from it. So you can do stuff inside of that especially styled uh, sandbox that in such a way that it doesn't impact either that interfere with each other's styles in the two different applications. So in this case, I, I have a bunch of uh, gists. They're like little snippets of code that you can get from GitHub. Um, and GitHub uh, gives the gists uh, or gives you an API to the gist so that you can display them in your browser. Say you've got like a web blog or something, you want to share some code. Um, you can put in like a little bit of JavaScript um, and it'll pull in the code in, in a certain style. So it looks familiar to, to GitHub users. Again, this is just an example of, of, of bringing in style content. You could use it for like displaying PDFs even or displaying charts from like a third party or, or something like that. Some kind of styles that you want to kind of isolate from, from Apex's built-in style. So what we'll see if we go through here is that um, I'm clicking on the, the items in, in the report on the left-hand side and it's bringing in these styles. None of this content uh, comes from Apex. None of this styling comes from Apex. It all comes from GitHub. Uh, but some of these fonts and some of these backgrounds and, and, and kind of borders and things are specific to how GitHub wants to display its gists, and I don't want that to collide with uh, the, the 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 Apex styling. Um, so I can, and and what else it's showing is is the same sort of technique as we saw previously, where you're updating sections of your Apex UI without having to reload the entire page, and I can even kind of switch the styling on the fly. So this is dark mode, which kind of matches with the the dark mode of the Apex app that it's contained in, um, or I can switch it off, and so I can switch the embedded content to light mode whilst having dark mode um, for the rest of my application. So uh, this is going to just reiterating what I've just said about the classic report showing the the list gists from GitHub. Not easy to say. Um, so every column in there is is every uh, column with a little eye icon in it, right? Is is a uh, a link. Um, we're using the same technique as we did for the like and dislike buttons, where we've given it a particular style so that we can target it with a dynamic action. When we click the dynamic action, instead of having like a whole bunch of JavaScript in there, we've got uh, a hidden page item called gist ID um, and a set value action. So instead of running some actual JavaScript code, it's just taking the value of the JavaScript expression, uh, which in this case is the gist ID for the element that triggered it the I icon, um, and it's moving or setting the data from that into this hidden page item, which is then available to your PL SQL code. And then it has another dynamic action. Instead of doing it in, in code, it's just got a like a sub action of the dynamic action, which says refresh that gist region. Um, and that region, I'm talking about this region on the right hand side here, is a dynamic content region. Now, for a long time, Apex has had this PL SQL uh, region type, which meant that at the time the page was first rendered, it would run some PL SQL code, generate some HTML, which would then get included in, in the response to, to your browser. And that was kind of a one hit thing, right? When the, when, the, when the page rendered, it got to one of these PL SQL regions, rendered the, or ran the PL SQL, rendered some HTML, included that in the response, and then that was it. It was kind of baked in. This new dynamic content region is, as the name suggests, more dynamic, right? You can refresh it and it'll then rerun the PL SQL code and regenerate the output. So if I just click on an, another one of these gists, it refreshes this region, which tells it to regenerate its content and then puts that back into the, into the page. So again, it's a more dynamic user interface without having to refresh the entire page. So in this case, again, this is, this is generating the, the, the gist, it could generate reports or charts or PDFs or, or whatever you want. Um, the, the magic, the secret source is this SR is that we're using an iframe to kind of isolate the content to, to kind of um, sandbox it. Um, and this uh, probably not very commonly used attribute of an iframe called SRC doc, source doc. Um, typically for an iframe, you just use SRC and then you point it to like another page, like another bit of HTML that would come from somewhere else. If you use source doc, you don't have to pull in that content from somewhere else. You can literally create a HTML document as a big long string 
put it into this source doc, and then that will be the content for your region. Um, so every time I refresh that region, this bit of PL SQL code runs, generates like a new miniature HTML document, and then returns uh, an, uh, um, a little snippet of HTML with an iframe with that content set as the um, document for that frame. So it's not pulling in anything externally. Um, it, it, it's generating it all in code and it's embedded in, in your in your Apex application. The advantage of that is, well, there's advantages and disadvantages, right? The advantage is it's not having to go somewhere else and do like another HTTP request to pull down more content. And that means that the the if you know about HTML, you'll understand that it's not then doing like a cross-origin request. So then if you do a cross-origin request, then there's, there's a sandbox involved so that the content in the iframe can't access the the, the site that is in, that's embedding it. Um, sometimes you want that for security reasons, and it's a, and it's a, obviously a good um, browser security feature, so that random content off the internet can't then kind of mess about with your Apex application. We don't want that. We want our Apex application to be able to talk to the contents of the iframe, and the iframe to be able to talk to our Apex application. So if we generate it like this. It's not cross origin. They both come from the same place, even though they're kind of insulated from each other by this frame. Um, so we can use this technique to, to embed content in your Apex application without either one affecting the style of the other. Um, so that is uh, how to do that with iframes. Next up, excuse me one second. So next, uh, we're going to use dynamic actions again. Um, uh, I think probably every single one. Of, oh no, the timing one doesn't. I was going to say every single one of these demos uses uh, dynamic actions, but I don't think it does. Um, dynamic actions are, are, are awesome. Um, as I say, they're a way of making your application, your Apex applications, more dynamic than just go to a page, fill in the page, submit the page, get a response. Um, you can you can react to people doing stuff in your application. You can change the user interface kind of on the fly, dynamic, and you know that's what people are used to, right? With their modern web applications they probably quite rarely these days they look a full page refresh obviously there's still a need for that and most apex applications work in that way but when you're in a page dynamic actions are how you make your apex application more dynamic so with that being said talking about kind of modern web applications this is kind of a throwback to oh sorry i'm looking talking about the world demo that i'm just about to to go into this is kind of a more of a throwback to the earlier days of the internet as you saw from my original bio um, i've been doing this for quite a long time since before the internet existed and in the early days image maps were a big thing everybody on their myspace page uh, for those that remember it would have like a, a, like a, some kind of funny image with like different links on different parts of the images to different parts of their their myspace uh, page so image maps is how they did that. You, you can assign different links to different parts of an image. There's certain caveats, and, and I kind of, if you look at the about information that I'll go through in a minute, there's there's certain caveats about using image maps uh, around accessibility in particular and responsiveness. Um, you know, if you're trying to do this on like a mobile form factor, there's certain considerations. But if you use them sparingly and you use them where they're supposed to be used and where they, they, they can best be used, then they can be useful, especially, surprise, surprise, given the name, for maps, because maps have lots of different regions in them. Um, so I've taken this map of the world and I've defined different regions in it. And then for every region, I live in Australia, just right about here by this little uh, bit that's sticking out. So if I click on Australia, it knows that I've clicked on that particular portion of that image. And what this is then doing is it's it's uh, that click has launched this dialogue in that dialogue. What it's doing is it's going away to an external endpoint, a REST service to give me information about that country. And all of this uh, has been done on the fly by, by Apex. What it's also doing, because of course I've got to find a way to uh, shoehorn some reference to cats into there is this information about cats is not in that external rest service but what apex does is it kind of turns an ex a call to an external rest service into something that looks a little bit like an sql query so then you can mash that up with local post processing now i say local it's not local to the browser it's local to the database that it's running in so I have a list of countries and the number of cats in each country in my database that backs this application. So this dialogue is going away. 
it's calling an external REST API to get information about a country. Then when that data comes back, I'm running a SQL query to find out the number of cats in that country. And that's locally in my, in my Apex database. So let's see how that works. So um, as I say, you should use it sparingly. Here's a link to a, a nice blog post that talks about the, the, the pros and cons of using image maps. They're, they're pretty not very commonly used, but um, sometimes they're just you know, super useful. So you include an image uh, in your page. That's not rocket science. The important bit is to set this kind of use map attribute. Now it uses this um, kind of hashtag map notation. That's not a CSS selector. I think it's just because it refers to the name of the map. Um, I guess it's because image maps were around before CSS existed, um, but this is the the technique you have to use. Um, and then you have a separate section in your Apex page, and you can just use um, static HTML region for this. Um, it's not going to show up in your UI at all. So you're going to use a blank with attributes, which is basically just a div element. So it won't appear visually in your application. It'll just be there in the background. And that holds like the image map. It doesn't have to be a map per se. It can be, I don't know, a picture of like your I don't know, your house or something like that. Although I guess that would be a map or your, your desk and it's got your computer on it and your monitor and you get different things depending on which item you, you click on, that sort of thing. Um, but it's an image map. And in that image map, there's a bunch of areas that define like the different regions of the image and where that is, is laid out uh, on the image. In this case, this polygon with these coordinates uh, defines the outline for Greenland. Alaska is just a rectangle and, and there's a bunch of other things that you can do. But because it's a, just a HTML attribute, you can, of course, target it with di dynamic actions like you can with, with any other HTML element. So the same as we did for, for the previous two demos, we create a dynamic action uh, and we target. So when you create a dynamic action, you can assign it to like a column in Apex terms or a button or a region or, or a bunch of other things. Um, but you can also use jQuery selectors. Um, so you can target like particular bits of HTML that might not be kind of native Apex controls. So in the case of this application, it is in the region with the ID of the map, and that is a CSS selector. It's not the same as this hash map here. So it's a region where this uh, map definition lives. It's looking for the map element, and it's looking for all the areas underneath that map. So whenever enemy clicks on an area in a map in this the region with this static ID, your dynamic action is going to fire. So that's how image maps, that's the image map part of this kind of demo. So I think I, I didn't really add it up, but I, I've I kind of said this is six secrets, but I think it's a lot more with these kind of little kind of asides and these kind of bonus secrets. Um, so this is the image map part of it. And if you just want your image map to um, navigate to different places, like different places in your Apex application, even then you could do that just with this standard href uh, attribute. But what we're going to do is every time someone clicks on an area, we're going to run a bit of JavaScript code so that we can pop up that dialogue and display that information uh, for the country that you've just clicked on. So similar to the cat uh, video demo, we're going to use Apex server process, which is a JavaScript API to run Ajax to call this particular Ajax callback, a bit of PL SQL code that, that lives in your database. Um, and we're going to pass across the alt text or the alt attribute of the element that triggered it, in this case, the you know, Greenland or Hawaii or whatever. Obviously, the same with the, the previous demos, you can pass across whatever parameters and attributes you like. You can embed it all in your HTML code and you can pass it all into your server side. For now, just the name of the country, which comes from the alt text is kind of all we need. So that's going to run some server side code, which we'll talk about in a second. And then it's going to, when the data comes back, it's going to call, a, it's going to pass back the URL and and the reason uh, and then it's it's going to pass back the URL and it's going to run this other bit of Apex JavaScript API to redirect the Apex user interface to a new page. Why do we have to do this on the server? Because Apex has uh, things called uh, checksums in the URL, and this is to stop people, uh, stop malicious users, kind of manip manipulating par parameters in your. Apex application um, before they're posted or after they've been posted or, or it's to, to stop people kind of um, forging requests to the Apex server, let's say. So um, if I want to launch 
this dialogue. Um, I need to get a, a particular URL in a particular format with a particular checksum that has the, the the parameters I want kind of encoded into it. You can turn off those checksums if you want, if you want to make your life simpler. Um, but I really rec would recommend that you don't because it's kind of an important security feature. It's called in different web application frameworks by different names that you might be kind of more familiar with. I think cross uh, CSRF, cross resource forgery something like that um again it's to stop you forging requests and 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 sending random parameters to to your application um so the upshot of that is the only way that we can generate this checksum um, with the parameters kind of encoded into it is on the server, which is why we can't just click on a link and have it pop up that dialogue. We have to go to the server, get the URL with the checksum, and then we can use this redirect API to, to call that dialogue. Now, you might think that redirect should send you to, to a different page. This API is, is smart enough to figure out that if, it, if you ask it to do a redirect, to something which is a modal dialogue, it pops up that modal dialogue rather than refreshing the whole page. Um, and it passes in the, the, the URL, which will have that parameter of the country that you clicked on kind of encoded into it. So this is the this is the the, the get URL. It's again, uh, this is an Apex server side, in this case, API, which gets your URL with the right checksum in. And this API knows enough about the pages within Apex to know that this page, page six is a dialogue. So it generates the right code to, to launch that dialogue. Um, and then you send that back in your JSON payload from your Ajax callback. And the, that dialog uses what's called a REST data source. Um, so this is a declarative way. Uh, and you can click on this link, which will take you to the, to the documentation for it. It's a declarative way of telling Apex how to call external REST APIs, how to map the payload uh, from the JSON that comes back from a REST data source, how to map that into things that look like columns. Uh, in a in a SQL query, it's a very nice uh, declarative way to do it, and and there's all sorts of other features around that. You you know you can automatically synchronize those uh, REST calls and 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 kind of cache the data locally in your Apex application. Again, if you go to this application and follow that link, it'll it'll talk more about that. But for now, know that we can create a classic report, which is this uh, section in the dialog. Um, it's a classic report with a slightly different styling. Again, it's it's kind of a built-in template that, that Apex gives you, which is like name value pairs instead of like a, uh, like a table that goes across and down. But normally you would base that on, a, on an SQL query. In Apex, you can base that on an external REST data source and Apex treats it exactly as if you've just run an SQL query locally. So what, and, and as I said earlier, because uh, Apex almost transforms your external REST data, uh, your REST endpoint response, it almost transforms that into, into uh, SQL data. You can then treat it just as if it's a table that, that is in your, your local database. Um, so in this case, this is the actual query. Uh, oh, sorry, this is the post-processing uh, SQL query. So the classic report is based on the REST data source, but then there's a post-processing query um, which runs this SQL. All of these columns at the top are coming directly from the REST data source. And then we're connecting that up to our local data, which is, this is a local table in my database, which is back in this application and getting the number of cats in each country. So hopefully that makes a, like a little bit of sense. As I say, it's, it's defined in different regions in this application that you can click on. It's then getting information from what you've just clicked on, passing that to an external REST endpoint, getting back the information from that and combining it with local data that's in your Apex database. So the next one you'll be pleased to know is quite a short little tip. So if you've worked with Apex for any length of time, then you'll know that there's all sorts of uh, debugging and activity uh, monitoring uh, uh, and instrumentation that you can you can put into your application to to find like pain points in your application, things that are taking a long time. But sometimes you just want like a real quick uh, metric of how long it's taken to load a page. A lot of web pages do this. Things like I think Confluence and stuff do it in the in, in the footer of that. It tells you how long it took, took you to render it, and it's just kind of useful to work out whether it's the server side code that's taking a long time, or whether there's some other issue that you need to investigate further. Or uh, maybe on the client, maybe they browsers out of date and it's and it's bogging down with some of the JavaScript, or maybe it's a network issue for some users. So sometimes it's useful to just get like a real 
quick measurement of how long this page took to render. Um, the important thing to note is, is, as I said before, Apex is getting more and more dynamic. It's getting more and more, so you don't have to do like a full page refresh to get data back. So this only applies to like the initial rendering of the page. If you've got regions in that page, which are lazy loaded, which aren't loaded until the whole of the rest of the page is loaded. This technique doesn't count how long it takes those regions to render. There are other te techniques that can use to do that, but that's kind of not the purpose of, of this kind of initial page load render timing. You know, users get bored if they're just looking at a, a blank screen or maybe they'll click a button and then like the little spinner will go in the, in the browser um, tab header, um, but they won't notice and they'll think, oh, nothing's happening. So they click again, click again, click again. And if you haven't coded your application correctly, then that can cause problems. So the quicker you can get the users looking at something, even if it's like a mostly blank screen with a bunch of like reports that later load in, the better. So I'm going to click on this. Um, it'll wait for a random amount of time. So you can see up in the, the, the tab bar, it's loading, it's loading, nothing's happening. The user's like, oh, what's going on? The application's broken, nothing's happening. And then finally it loads in. Um, so this is not just my application being slow. I've purposefully slowed it down so we can see this technique in action. So this again is my favorite region, the uh, dynamic content region. And this is specifically written to take a random amount of time. Um, these are my two of my cats, which generally sleep for more than seven seconds at a time. Um, but they're just there so that when this page renders, you know, it starts up at the header, it renders, um, you know, spread come region or this hero region, then it renders the other kind of static read or static regions in your page. Generally, they're, they're generated by PL SQL or, or reports that aren't lazy loaded, something like that. Finally, it generates this, which again is static uh, HTML. And then finally, it gets down to the footer where it writes the render time into the footer. So although this region here only slept for 7.86 seconds, the actual render time for the whole of the page, including all this stuff and these menu items down the left hand side, everything until we get up to this footer, obviously, we can't time it after that footer's been rendered because then we we've got no code left to to render it in so there's a, like a little bit of overhead on top of uh, the region that i've used to artificially slow it down and we can do it again we'll get a different kind of random timing again you know the users reload it's like nothing's happening they haven't noticed this little spinner up here so whatever we can do to speed up that initial page load in this case i could just switch this region to be lazy loaded and then the whole page would load in in like what point one of a second or something like that um, and then the the dynamic content region would load in afterwards but sometimes you you don't want to or you can't use lazy loading um so how do we do that again it's a real short tip it's another thing that is kind of semi supported this was given by patrick wolf you know long time uh, apex uh, team member and uh, legend of the apex community so if he says if it's good enough for him to use it's good enough for, for me to use um and all this does this is this is just the uh region which uses like dbms random and dbms session dot sleep to wait for a certain amount of time you're obviously not going to do that you're you're just going to run your application and maybe it takes a long time maybe it doesn't um and the 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 secret source one of the bits of secret sources this is another one of my kind of two for one secrets um is this apex application dot get elapsed time now there used to be a, a different api for doing this in one of the wwv packages wwv flow i can't remember what it's called but the point is that you shouldn't use anything which is prefixed by wwv their internal apex apis that are very much subject to change but anything with an apex application or apex prefix should be safe to use this isn't actually documented but you know it's in a public uh, package now so it's kind of out in the wild people use it so Hopefully we, we're not going to pull the rug out from from under if you if you start using it. There's some comments in, in these forum posts that even if we were to deprecate that API, there are other ways of doing it. They're a little bit more code heavy, um, but it's certainly possible. So with a lot of the stuff here, even if I talk about it not being supported, um, there are ways to do it should we remove uh, the facility from, from the core Apex product. So don't kind of panic too much if you use some of these techniques. Um, so the other thing, so this is getting the elapsed time. So, th so this uh, is initialized when Apex first starts rendering the page. And then when you call this function, it gives you back the time it's taken so far to render that page. And what we do here is is another kind of it's not really a secret, but it's it's a useful thing. Um, obviously, in your Apex application, when you're defining it in 
page designer, you can put in some JavaScript code that you want to execute when that page first loads, when all the DOMs loaded uh, and all everything else is, is ready to go. You can run some code. Sometimes, rarely, you want to inject some code into your page at runtime, and that's exactly what this is doing. Um, so you can run, as the page is being rendered, you can run this PL SQL API, which kind of registers some JavaScript code to, to temporarily be run uh, when the page first renders. By temporarily, I mean, it's not baked into the definition of the page. It's in your code, so you can programmatically call it or not. So all this is doing is, is running some code when the page loads to inject that render time into the uh, footer of your page. And because this is an application process, you can uh, turn it on for all pages and turn it off for all pages. You can turn it on for some pages. Um, you can enable it if for particular users, if they're having issues um, and things like that. And, and you can use this technique uh, again to kind of temporarily without changing the, the actual definition of the page to kind of temporarily inject JavaScript code into your page. So I said that was going to be quite a short one, but uh, as usual, I've kind of gone off on a tangent um, and talked about other things. Uh, but uh, that might be useful to you, to you if you if you want to do some quick uh, page timings. Now I'm conscious I've only got ten minutes left, um, but luckily I'm on my last uh, little bit of a demo. So this is talking about uh, tab content again. Uh, I'm going to use my favorite dynamic content regions, but it doesn't have to be dynamic content regions or, or ideally it would be content which is dynamic but it doesn't have to be a dynamic content region in quotes anything that supports being refreshed like card regions or reports or uh charts that sort of thing you can use in tabs and and, and the cool thing about lazy loaded content in tabs is that that content you've got like a whole bunch of tabs the content in the tab that aren't activated won't be loaded until that tab is activated, which is super useful if you've got like a bunch of content which runs expensive queries or builds like big complicated charts or I don't know, some sort of weird JavaScript animations that take up a lot of processing power on the client. So let's have a look at what that looks like. So in here, I've got um, a tab region with like a bunch of different tabs for different kinds of animals. You, you saw when we first came into the page, initially there was no content in there. This region was very narrow. I've done that kind of on purpose, um, kind of left that kind of jank in there so you can you can see it, it happening. But, you know, you, can, you could give that region like a, a set size um, so that it doesn't kind of start small and then expand out big. But for the purpose of the demo, um, it, it's there so you can see it happening. And as I navigate, so at the moment, the only content that's loaded in this page is this cat. Um, all these other tabs, because they haven't been activated yet, and they're set to, to lazy load, only uh, load their content when I click on that tab, when I activate it. Um, so you can activate the cat, the dog, uh, random dog page, the random fox in a hoodie for some reason, or a random duck. And I'm very upset that I couldn't find another random animal API that was just three letters like, I don't know, bat or something like that. But anyway, ducks are cool. So that's good. So a standard feature of Apex is if you have these lady, lazy loaded regions, they won't get loaded until you activate that tab. And then when I subsequently activate those tabs, it knows that it's already lazy loaded that content. So it doesn't reload it. It just keeps it as it is. Now that is fine in a lot of circumstances, but sometimes you want this content to reload itself when you activate that tab. The particular use case that I came up with this solution for was someone where they had like big reports, like huge reports, like, I don't know, three pages long with like all sorts of coming from an external source. And they had all sorts of kind of weird charts, not Apex charts, but like JavaScript rendered charts and, and animations and things like that. And they were very slow to render and they took up a lot of processing power in the in the browser. And they wanted them to refresh every time you went to a, to a new tab. So it got the, the latest data. So like I say, by default, Apex will realize that it's lazy loaded these regions and it won't reload them. But you can make them reload. Uh, if I turn on auto refresh in this app, um, obviously you wouldn't have this in your app, this auto refresh switch. That's just so that I can demonstrate the, the, the technique. 
But now with that turned on, when I navigate to these different tabs, it reloads them. Um, and so every time I go to the fox tab, I get a different dog, a uh, different fox. Uh, every time I go to the dog tab, I get a different dog. Um, and so, or a pig in this case, a <laughs> dog. Um, and the same for cat. And so every time I go to these different tabs, it's going to reload it. If I turn off the auto refresh, what you'll see then is that what I've also done here is that every time a different tab gets activated, the content for the non-active tabs gets cleared out. Again, you wouldn't do this in a in a real application because you know it looks kind of weird. You wouldn't allow people, or you probably wouldn't allow people to turn on and off that auto refresh. But what that does, if you if you have a lot of content in these other tabs, which as I said is is very big, very heavy, you might want to save processing power in in your user's browser, especially for mobile. Um, you might want to like clear a whole bunch of stuff out of the, the a lot of hid, hidden elements that are in. Uh, tabs that are not active you want, might want to hide those to to save memory in your browser and and this does that optionally it's it's done in code so we'll see how to turn that off so how does that work this is the random animal apis which you can look at at your leisure so as i say the region is set to lazy load so their content's only rendered when they're activated for the first time if you want to re-render that content when the tab is reactivated you listen for this special custom event uh, um I said that dynamic actions listen for like on clicks and things like that in the past in our, our video demo. Um, you clicked on the buttons and that click is a dynamic action. You can also have dynamic actions with, with custom names and this is one of them. Again, this is not documented, but it's in a whole bunch of blogs all over the internet so people do use it. Uh, I checked with John Snyders, who is like a, a UI expert, you know, another uh, legend of, of the Apex development team and community and he gave the go ahead for people to use this. Again, we want to kind of revamp this, this component, but for now, this is the way to do it. So every time I click on a tab, it's activated. This custom event is fired and I only have four minutes left. So I'm going to go through this super quick. Again, you can look at this application. You can look at this code and you can dissect it at your leisure. But basically, whenever I click on a tab region, which is like the dog, cat, fox, duck thing at the top, it fires this custom event this bit of javascript gets called when that custom event happens it looks to find the active tab in the current region it looks to find the region within that tab like the panel that that tab has activated and then it does a bunch of checks to make sure that we have an active region it sets the id of the region that's just been activated so that the server side code knows that it is the active region this is my bit of a switch uh, that you probably wouldn't use in your application to say if i want it to dynamically refresh then it should this is the bit of code that clears out all the other dynamic content regions so like i say frees up memory or or, or shuts down processing that's that's expensive in the client um you don't have to do that you can leave the other tabs as you are as they are if you want and then if we have an active id and there is a region with that id and that region supports being refreshed then refresh it and that's all there is to do it and then of course you can have whatever dynamically refreshable content you like in that region. In this case, it's it's programmatically calling a REST endpoint rather than using a REST data source, which we used in the in the map demo. So it's it's calling this this endpoint to get a random cat image. Um, it's doing a bunch of error checking. You'll obviously want to do more. It's passing that response and it's looking to see if is there a URL in there that I can use for an image. And if there is, then it sends back a little paragraph element with uh, an image in it based on that. Um, but like I say, it can be whatever dynamic content you like in there. The kind of purpose of this demo is to show you how to automatically refresh the content that's in tab regions every time the tab is activated. And that is all I've got. Look, I've got two minutes left. I, I haven't been monitoring the, the q and I'm afraid, because I've been talking far too fast. Um, but I don't know if we've got a few minutes. I can try and answer some questions if we have any. Um, <clears throat> Ed, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we just have only three questions, and uh, these have already been answered. Okay. So I want to highlight quickly what question was on about using HTML. And Taufik answered that. And there was another question on Apex application get elapsed time. And the question was from Marco. Um, is this supported by older Apex versions? And yes, this is available from version 5.0. And there was one more question on performance optimization from Kanaya, which she has already answered as well. Cool. Awesome. That's so, pretty much. And uh, uh, there is one comment by Kavya Shri. If you look up the Q&A. Free 
takes more time to load in tab region, even if lazy loading is selected. I mean, it, yes, it will take a little bit longer. I mean, that's the that's the payoff. I mean, it, it it shouldn't ultimately take any longer to render on the server because it's still the same um, SQL being executed um, to to generate that region. But it's going to take a little bit more time because there's like another HTTP request that's got to go to the server, render that code, then it's got to come back down the wire, and then it's got to be kind of inserted back into the DOM. Um, versus, you know, the page just running. And, and rendering each content as it gets to it and then kind of sending that back with like a single response. So it, it might take a little bit longer, but it shouldn't take appreciably longer. Um, if it does, then um, please put together um, a reproducible test case for us um, and mention it in the in the forums and uh, we'll take a look. Thank you, Ed. So I don't see any more questions. Uh, I think we are good. That was a fantastic, brilliant session by Ed. Thank you so much. We have recorded this session and this will be available for playing back from the office hours jpac office hours page now moving on to conclusion for today's session so yeah so if you are uh, a partner looking uh for helping out your customers and you know building innovative applications if you are a customer seeking help with apex reach out to us we are here to listen and help you out uh, out there is uh, Application Express support team mailing list. So please do reach out to us for any questions. And you can also reach out to the, any of the Apex team member. We are very active on Twitter, LinkedIn, and other social media channels. So please do feel free to reach out to us and post any questions. And most importantly, as Ed was pointing out, please do use our external Apex forums, which is an Apex application. Please do post your questions there. And are you a developer who has built a cool Apex app and would love to showcase to the community? Please do let us know. This is a great platform to showcase those applications. We would also like to highlight those customers and partners who have some solve complex business problems. And if you'd like to share tips and tricks, please reach out to us. We are happy to host you in this uh, initiative, Apex Office Hours JPAC. And are you looking for Apex Office Hours in your regional language? Please do let us know. Any other ideas or tips and tricks for improving the office hours, please do let us know. Please do write to us at application express underscore ww at oracle.com. What's next coming up on April 20th at 11:30 a.m. IST, uh, 6 UTC? We have introduction to Apex in Japanese language. So please do join us for this first session in Japanese. And uh, please do subscribe to apex.oracle.com slash go slash JPAC. We also need help from our partners and customers and the Apex community to spread the word of the JPAC office hours. We would like to host sessions in Japanese and other regional languages as well. So please do help us out with speakers as well as with tips and tricks and more ideas as well. If you haven't missed any office hour session, you can watch from the playlist. The link is available on the slide for you. Learn more, everything and anything about Apex, apex.oracle.com. We also have links on uh, for Apex on autonomous database there and Apex education and Apex blogs as well and Apex community. That's pretty much from us for today. Thank you so much everyone for joining us and thank you once again, Ed, for a wonderful session today. Thank you everyone and you have a wonderful day ahead. Thank you. Bye for now.